Aloha, everybody. Welcome to our May installment of the Slice of PyCast seminar sponsored by the Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center or PyCask. Welcome everybody online. Thanks for folks for uh, being here in the room with us. Um, I'm Brad Romine. I'm the deputy director of the PyCast University Consortium located here at UH Manoa. And um, quick uh, review of what this Slice of PyCast seminar series is about. We're, we're focused on providing a platform for sharing ongoing and state-of-the-art climate adaptation research and science manage management applications in Hawaii, the U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands and beyond. Uh, this presentation is being recorded um, and will be available on the podcast website under news events um, a few days after the uh, seminar. Uh, for those joining us online, welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, please keep your microphones on mute during the presentation. We will have time for questions following the presentation. Uh, please feel free to leave your questions in the chat along the way um, or save them um, for the Q&A portion at the end. At the conclusion of our seminar, uh, for those online, please com uh, complete our short survey. Uh, the survey is helping us in planning future podcast seminars and the survey will pop up after you log off from the Zoom meeting. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Dennis LaPointe, who will be sharing with us today about climate change, larval mosquito habitat, and riparian corridors, potential pathways to mosquito invasion and malaria transmission in Hakalau Forest National Wildlife Refuge. Dr. LaPointe is a research ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey's Pacific Islands Ecosystems Research Center. He studied the ecology of introduced avian disease and its impact on endemic Hawaiian birds for the past 26 years. Most recently, his research has focused on supporting the development of landscape level mosquito control and exploring the effects of climate change on the spread and establishment of vectors and avian disease. Dennis's background is in entomology with uh, his PhD from UH Manoa. So thank you very much, Mahalo Dennis, for being here with us today. And we'll pass it over to you for your presentation. Okay. Um, is it share, share screen? Let me make sure that I'm sharing my screen. Are you all set? Looks good on me. Okay, good. Okay. Well, um, today I'm gonna um, I'm gonna talk about some ongoing research, and this research is um, funded by PyCast, and uh, we're trying to look at uh, the mosquito vector of avian malaria, how it is potentially using um, larval habitat and riparian corridors, how those habitat are affected by climate change and what this potentially means for remaining native forest bird communities in Hakalau Forest National Wildlife Refuge. Hmm. Okay, for some reason I've got to... Okay. So for a little background, um, the Hawaiian Islands are, are one of the few oce uh, oceanic land masses without um, native mosquitoes. The southern house mosquito, Culex quinquefasciatus, was the first of six mosquito species or biting mosquito species to become established in the islands. And it arrived approximately or more or less around 1826. It's a tropical paradomestic mosquito. It's kind of a tramp species. It's all over the tropics and subtropics of the world. And when it arrived in Hawaii, it rapidly spread throughout the islands and residential and agricultural areas, and ultimately into the lowland native forests. And at that time, it's when people started noticing some declines in the native birds and birds with particularly nasty looking lesions that were most likely caused by pox, another um, viral disease that is transmitted by uh, the mosquito, all by the turn of the century. So by the time of the first comprehensive studies on um, Hawaiian forest birds in the early 
60s and 70s, most forest bird species had disappeared from the lowlands and were now restricted to the high elevation forests. The assumption was that this is where the tropical vector um, could not become established. And the other uh, pictures on the slide there, aside from the southern house mosquito feeding on a bird, which you may ask, how does a mosquito feed on a, a bird's eye? But um, Culex quinquefasciatus is nocturnal, and for the most part, birds are asleep at night. Um, the next picture shows avian pox virus, and this was the first disease to really um, become obvious to naturalists at the turn of the century. It was recognized by 1902. Um, we have studied pox. It's still prevalent in the forest, but it doesn't seem to have as, um, as much as a mortality effect as avian malaria. And of course, avian malaria is the pathogen that we're all concerned about. And that's a blood bond parasite that destroys red blood cells and really leads to uh, poor condition in the birds. And they usually succumb to uh, weather or predation at that point. So the endemic Hawaiian honey creepers represent this extraordinary adaptive radiation from an ancestral rose finch and have been the hardest hit taxa. Uh, more than half of the original 50 plus known species are now extinct. And if you're not familiar with these bill birds, you can look at the bill modifications in that uh, diagram to the, to the uh, left which shows some of the birds that are adapted for nectar feeding, like the eevee or the um, mama, which is now extinct with the large curled beaks, or the Palau with the straight lower mandible and the curved upper mandible, which uses those like a woodpecker to pry apart wood and extract um, native insects. Today, avian malaria remains the key factor in the decline of forest bird populations and the main obstacle to recovery of endangered and threatened Hawaiian forest birds. The once stable populations residing in higher, cooler forests are now in decline. Populations of the uh, Akoi Koi and uh, Kiwi Kiu on East Maui have plummeted in the last decade, while on Kauai, Breeding populations of the critically endangered Akiki and Akeke have crashed. And you can see some of the range reduction that's occurred for Akoi Koi on Maui. Koi Koi is uh, this, uh, one of the, the largest, at least, uh, uh, rainforest um, species of honey creeper in the islands. Um, these population curves uh, depict just how dire the situation is. These are the four endangered species, uh, Kiki and Akake from Kauai, and uh, Akiwikiu and the Akoi Koi from Maui. And you can see just how um, rapid their populations are declining. Uh, if you look at the numbers, there's varying numbers there. Some populations are in better cases, like KK and Akoi Koi are in better numbers, but they still have a rapid descent. Uh, most critical is perhaps um, the Akikiki. Uh, current estimates for time to extinction in the wild for all four species is within 10 to 15 years. The Akikiki already uh, is probably functionally extinct in the wild. On both islands, there's evidence of increased transmission of avian malaria, where the vector Culex quinquefasciatus has become increasingly widespread in the forest uh, following local climate change. This current extinction crisis has prompted the state and federal agencies to aggressively fund and develop of a landscape scale mosquito control. Uh, working with Verily Life Sciences and USGS disease ecologists to develop a Wolbachia based insect incompatib incompatibility technique, or IIT control strategy. Uh, state and federal land managers hope to release incompatible male mosquitoes on the landscape by the fall of 2023. In the meantime, 
remaining populations of Akiki are being brought into captivity to prevent imminent extinction. At Hakala, we hope we have some time left before populations begin to show a rapid decline. Uh, following the completion of the Hawaiian forest bird survey in the uh, late 70s, um, and, and, uh, the Hakalau uh, Forest National Wildlife Refuge was uh, established to preserve some of the best native montane forest habitat and the most intact native bird communities on the Big Island. Over the ensuing years, the refuge has managed feral ungulate populations and reforested much of the former pasture land. And while the populations of native forest birds on other islands have plummeted, Hakala's forest bird populations have largely remained stable. Only in the last decades have we begun to notice declining trends are beginning to emerge for species, including the endangered Alawi and Akepa. But what is driving these recent declines when populations have been stable for so long? Most evidence points to uh, climate change impacts on disease transmission dynamics. So avian malaria has a complex developmental life cycle on the mosquito, and it's dependent on ambient temperatures. There's a threshold temperature of about 13 degrees C, below which the parasite does not develop at all. It doesn't kill the parasite, but it won't develop either. And it has to develop to get to the infective stage in which the parasite can be passed on to the next host. Um, the most intact native forest bird communities were found in forests in and above uh, 13 the, the 13 degree isotherm, where parasite development would be severely limited. Um, as you come down on the mountain between 17 C and 13 degree isotherms, there's short seasonal transmission of disease. However, as the graph on the left shows manual, annual, uh, mean annual temperatures at some critical forest bird habitat has already occurred. Uh, the maps on the right show the current extent of forest bird habitat um, specific preserves above these isotherms. And the functional loss of that habitat was a 2% warming scenario. It may be a little difficult to see the fine lines on each of those uh, projections of the mountains but basically, in the case of um, Hakalau, which is on uh, the Big Island, uh, a 2% increase in um, global temperature or mean temperature at those elevations would essentially reduce the actually effective uh, manage, uh, refuge size by about 60%. As you can see on the bottom, um, that's a profile for Kauai. You can see that a uh, yellow line uh, designates um, available habitat where there might be some disease, um, but as you can see, uh, seasonal disease, but you can see with a two degree increase in uh, warming temperatures, uh, that uh, area is really, really, really constricted. And now all the lowlands are where disease can occur year round and intensely. So our simplistic modeling from 20 years ago has been early accurate when the recent rapid declines of bird numbers on both Kauai and Maui. Um, but warming temperatures uh, likely tell only part of the story. Uh, precipitation trends indicate drying conditions throughout the islands and decreasing base flow of perennial streams. This allows for the formation of stagnant stream pools that provide suitable habitat for Culex lurie and a potential pathway for mosquito invasion into higher elevation forests. There is also evidence from Kauai streams that the duration between high water events has increased in the last few decades. This becomes important when considering the development time of immature larvae in these stream associated habitats. I'll get to a little bit more on that later, some of our actual data. Um, so what is the mosquito situation at Hakalau? Well, the earliest record for uh, Chilus quinquefaciatus occurring in the island, um, at least in the lands of uh, Hakalau Forest 
National Refuge were observed by um, Swayze and Williams back in 1931. Uh, they reported egg rafts and larvae troughs and uh, spring pools at Naui and Kanakulu around 1600 meters above sea level. So it's not like uh, mosquitoes are just making their way up to the mountains. The mosquitoes probably have been making their way up to the mountains uh, for decades or ever since they were established in the islands. It's just whether or not they've become well established there. Um, I sampled um, Upper Puakala and Malua back, back when I was doing my dissertation in 1993. Um, I had elevational sites from 13 to 18 hundred meters on Malua track and at 1800 meters on Puakala. Um, I captured uh, mosquitoes for several months or tried to capture mosquitoes for several months and only found mosquitoes in Malua track between 1500 and 1800 meters. Um, with just a little effort, I was able to locate where those adult mosquitoes were coming from and it was from bathtub troughs that had been left out in the old pasture land and piles of discarded tires left behind by former ranches. Uh, the larval habitat was removed at that time and the adult mosquitoes disappeared. I didn't catch any mosquitoes over in Puakala. So we didn't get back into uh, Hakala, or I didn't, until 1998 when Carter Atkinson and I surveyed both um, sites in Puakala, Naui, and Malua at 1800 meters down to uh, 1300 meters. We uh, captured no adult mosquitoes, uh, but found larvae and one stream pool along the lower uh, section of the Avehi stream. And we were surveying uh, kilometer length sections of streams throughout the um, refuge. Uh, from 2001 to 2004, Lenny Freed and his students from UH Manoa who had ongoing um, studies on many of the native birds at Puakala started to operate over position traps. They put out buckets with an infusion in it to see if they could get mosquitoes to oviposit or egg lay in them. And they only detected one egg raft and 46 um, nights of observation, 146 nights of observation. And then in 2012, I returned to Hakalau and repeated the survey we had conducted 15 years earlier. This time we captured one adult Culex quinquefasciatus at our low 1300 meter site in Puakala. Um, we observed many Aedes japonicus, another species that had arrived in the islands since our last survey, um, and many uh, japonicus larvae at the lowest sites, but no Culex quinquefasciatus on it. At the time, interestingly, we had found that the prevalence of malaria had decreased since our earliest time in 1998. Now, the most recent work has been done by a Pat Hart's graduate student, Stephanie Maletnik um, from UH Hilo, and she performed an exhaustive survey across the refuge for mosquitoes using um, passive gravid traps, and she also searched for natural larval habitat in the form of tree fern cavities. She found no Culex quinquefasciatus larvae in any of the tree uh, ferns in Hakalau and captured no adult mosquitoes in over 5,700 trap nights. But Stephanie did not give up and she set CO2 baited traps at Puakala as part of a, a DOFA funded project. In the and in the first week caught one uh, Culex quinquefasciatus adult in Puakala. Dova has continued that trapping for over a year and a half now and has not captured another mosquito. Uh, my point with this long litany of efforts is that Culex quinquefasciatus has been detected in Hakalau over the years, but in those detections are extremely rare. As previous studies hadn't shown suitable habitat for larval, uh, Culex quinquefasciatus is limited in Hakalau. This may be one reason why malaria prevalence at Hakala has, has remained low over the past three decades. To support the management of native birds at Hakala, we have initiated a project funded by PICASC and in collaboration with the Pacific Islands Water Science Center, looking at how changes 
and precipitation and hydrological factors may affect the availability of larval mosquito habitat along the many streams that flow down from Hakalau Forest. As perennial streams become more intermittent, drying stream beds may provide local habitat for larval mosquitoes. We also hope to assess if those stream corridors could serve as invasion routes from the lower forest and agricultural areas where mosquitoes are abundant. To that end, we have established six, six study sites along two streams, the Hakalau stream within the refuge and the Ka'ava Li'i stream within the adjacent state forest reserve. Each stream has three sites, an upper site where flow is typically intermittent and a middle and low site where the stream flow is more perennial in nature. At each site, we monitor precipitation, stream height, ambient temperature, and water temperature. The sites are on an altitudinal gradient starting at about 1,000 meters above sea level on the lower section of the Ka'avali'i stream. Um, the middle and upper section of that stream are at 1,200 and 1,300 meters above sea level. And then on Hakalau stream, the lower section begins at 1,300 meters and the middle and upper sections are located at 15 and 1,700 meters respectively. Or respectively. At each site, we have established a, a climate station recording precipitation and ambient temperature. We have established stream gauges to monitor stream height. And at monthly intervals, we survey a 200 to 250 meter section at each stream and count the number of discrete pools in every 10 meter section of the stream. Now that map shows you the uh, 200 meter reach of stream that we return and sample each month. Um, each pool is sampled for the presence of mosquito larvae. But we also intensely sample 10 previously identified pools uh, sites during each visit. These are repeat um, sampling pools, the same pool each time. Uh, we hope by modeling the abundance of available larval habitat with seasonal changes in precipitation and stream height, we might be better able to inform managers of the relative risk of mosquito invasion and establishment as regional drying and, and droughts continue. Um, mosquito larvae are not found in flowing water. Um, they're really poor swimmers at that, and they're filter feeders, so they do best if they can graze on um, substrates in um, non-flowing water or even sit and spin around and filter feed in the water column itself. Um, but there are some uh, species that are adapted to streams and associated stream pools. One of those is the most recent mosquito to have become established in the Hawaiian Islands, Hades japonicus. Um, it arrived in 2002 and it now occurs in the high islands. So um, it's one of the mosquitoes that we do find in the streams regularly. Um, Aedes japonicus is a good proxy for Culex quinquefasciatus, but it does not vector avian disease, so we're not so concerned about its presence in the refuge. But it has also has several uh, differences that make it in its natural history that makes it more likely and more successful in the stream environment. Uh, in my cartoon cross-section of a rocky uh, stream channel, um, water has filled the channel from one bank to the other, and the only available habitat is in the perch pool in the far left here. But as uh, high water recedes, water-filled rock holes are revealed that can be suitable habitat for uh, Aedes japonicus and Culex quinquefasciatus. And uh, this is an example of a perch pool. They are much higher up on the stream channel. They're actually above the normal flowing channel. Um, they would be swept clean in a um, high water event but typically they're um, more permanent than any of the other habitats. And of course the rock holes are, are, are just that. Um, they are either bored out by stones in the rock's surface or just natural depressions in the bedrock of, of the stream. Um, and then um, as the stream dries up completely, then the bottom of the stream channel itself becomes a pool that we can sample. Um, again, um, at monthly intervals, we survey that 250 meter range, reach, and we're looking for discrete pools every 10 meters. 
uh, the total number of pools are broken down into the four types that we've identified. Perch pools, which are above the rocky stream channel, and that usually have mud and litter associated with them. And then the three remaining are basically size variations of rock holes. Um, and usually they are smaller up on the, the higher ends of the, um, the stream channel and get larger and larger as you move down into the deeper parts of the channel. Um, during monthly visits, uh, we uh, monitor the 10 uh, previously selected pools at each study site. Uh, pools are selected to represent different types of the pools present in that have, have with and without larvae. So we have a number of rock holes of varying sizes and any perch pools that are also in the area in that mix. Um, we also try to get um, select pools that are from different dis distances from the main channel. So see how high water events may affect those pools as well. Uh, we have five tidbit data loggers, which we deploy in five of the pools. Uh, we keep them tethered on a long fishing line to make sure that when a high water event occurs, we don't lose the $250 logger. And uh, even with our best, uh, best intentions, we have lost a number of the loggers. Okay, so some of the data, and I know this is a real busy slide, but basically the graph shows um, precipitation over the course of a, a year. Um, we got the um, stream gauges up a little later in the year, but that's the orange trace that you're looking at. So um, peak heights in the streams are mimicking those precipitation events. And so the, um, the graphs, um, at the top of, of the graphic the histograms or the, or the bar graphs at the top of the row, they're trying to show the different availability at different points throughout the year of uh, the larval habitat. Interestingly, or surprisingly to me at least, um, the amount, the total amount of available habitat doesn't seem to change that much throughout the year. Um, you would expect that. Um, you know, after a um, after a uh, high water event, that there would be a lot more, and and after the water has receded, there'd be a lot more habitat involved. You would also expect that after a long uh, dry period, such as you see there in the middle of the summer from you know, July and through um, October, uh, you would also see a, a a real decline in the number of small uh, pools. But um, really, the numbers stay fairly. Um, static throughout the year. Um, what's most interesting, I think, is the perch pools, which don't change much at all in number, but they do seem to disappear uh, later in the summer. And I think that's an effect of never being really rinsed over or washed over in a high water event yet, um, and yet going through the continuous evaporation um, over a dry summer. Um, this next um, slide shows um, some of the um, temperatures we've measured in those um, repeat sampled pools. And um, like plasmodium, uh, insects require a favorable ambient temperature to complete their growth and development. Uh, Culus quinquefaciatus requires 179 degree days to complete its immature development from egg to pupa and ultimately to escape the aquatic uh, realm as an adult mosquito. Therefore, water temperatures above the critical threshold temperature of 10 degrees C are critical. Uh, stream pools in, in the uh, Lee stream during summer have a mean water temperature of about 16 degrees C, um, approximately six degrees higher than the threshold development temperature. At that temperature, it would take 30 um, days for quinks to complete its immature development. In winter, uh, pool temperatures average about 12 or 13 degrees C. And at that temperature, um, it would only be three degrees above the threshold temperature. It would take roughly 60 days to complete its development. But as you move up the mountain and you get to a middle Hakalau stream site at 1500 meters, mean summer temperatures are still around 16 degrees. Um, and immature uh, quinks could complete the development 
um, in about a month, but the winter mean temperatures drop to 10 degrees. And at that point, the development um, is the development threshold for um, Culex larvae. So Culex quicofasiatus cannot survive temperature, can survive temperatures below 10 degrees C, but it has a profound effect on their daily survivorship. So in a nutshell, what that clearly states is that, um, um, you know, mosquitoes can pretty much um, complete cohort, provided there are, uh, there's long enough durations um, that there isn't high water events before the development um, can be completed. Um, mosquitoes can complete their development in 30 days or two months time at the lower and high sites along um, until you get up to about 1500 meters in the winter, then it just becomes too cold for them. Um, and cohorts of uh, mosquitoes that are kind of um, in this suspended growth phase I, at 10 degrees C, they're going to die off over time. And as the winter progresses, any localized populations of the mosquitoes and any overwintering populations as um, larvae are just going to die off. This may be one reason why we don't see persistent populations or populations become established in the higher elevations at Hakalong. Um, this next graph is just um, looking at the duration um, between high water events over the last year. And so you can see from May to um, July, there was very little uh, precipitation to speak of. And um, at that point, the stream was probably close to its base flow. And so any larvae developing during that time would have any larvae in the streams would have up to 70 days before a catastrophic event in, a, in terms of high water would come through and potentially flush that environment and all those mosquitoes out. Um, the summer got quite dry and uh, you know there was another stretch of 125 days before another high water event that was likely to flush out those cavities would occur. So it was a good year for producing mosquitoes on site at the lower elevations along uh, of a Lee stream. But as you get uh, up into the winter months and the rains return, uh, those durations between um, catastrophic high water events are shorter. And of course, um, for any mosquito, 48 days at cooler temperatures is not enough time for development. So again, even at the lower elevation, winter temperatures combined with um, heavier rainfall during the winter time will limit continuous populations or immature populations in the streams. At this point, I think I may be running out of time and I, I, I haven't really uh, prepared much on the mosquitoes themselves. And yet that seems to be what this whole talk is about. Um, but just, just to, so that you know who the players are in these streams, um, basically we're looking at an 80s uh, mosquito, 80s japonicus. I mentioned that it arrived um, as late as 2002 on the Big Island, but it has rapidly spread um, throughout the Big Island. I find it at ele any elevation where I find standing or stream uh, pools. Um, I found it on Maui, I found it on Kauai. As far as I know, it's, and while I know it's present on Oahu as well, and it's probably a, present on all the main Hawaiian islands. Um, it is a stream adapted species, so its natural habitat are slow pools, rock holes associated with streams. It's also a more temperate species. It comes from Northern Asia, so it's better adapted to cooler temperatures at higher elevations. Uh, Culex quinquefasciatus, well, the third thing about 80s mosquitoes is they have drought resistant eggs, and they glue those eggs to the substrate of potential larval habitat. So as water recedes in a rock hole, um, gravid um, female 80s will lay their eggs right on the rock there. So the next time that rock hole floods and the habitat is again available to the larvae, they can hatch out. The difference with Culex quinquefasciatus is they lay all their eggs in one egg graph and that egg graph hatches within 48 hours depending on temperature. 
So they really don't have that potential to, to have a, a seed store, so if you will, on site, ready to take um, advantage of an ephemeral habitat, like a small uh, rock hole. So they have to be present in the environment all the time in order to make use of those um, ephemeral habitats. Culex quick fasciatus is also develops a little slower than 80s aegypti. I mean, excuse me, 80s, 80s japonicus. Um, and for that reason, they might be more susceptible to um, conditions where there are uh, the duration between high water events is not as long as, as uh, they have been um, becoming at least. I think, I don't know where I am time-wise, but I think it may be time. We're okay, Dennis. We're uh, got maybe 10 more minutes if you need. Okay, well, no, let's leave that for questions. Um, anyways, this project has had a slow start <laughs> during the first COVID year, and it continues to challenge us, mostly me, on a weekly basis, largely in part because of the remote nature of uh, study sites. Um, but I have a great field crew, and Matt May and Alexis always seem to be smiling in their photos from the field. Um, and I would like to acknowledge our DOI agency collaborators and funders, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife folks at Hakalau Forest National Wildlife Refuge, um, the U.S. Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center, and the USGS uh, Pacific Islands Water Resource Center, and of course our own USGS Ecosystems Invasive Species Program, both for support and funding. I would also like to acknowledge the hard work of our technicians and volunteers. Without them, none of this would get done. Okay, well, I'll end it right there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis, for being with us here today. Um, now's a chance to answer or ask any questions you might have, Dennis. Um, welcome folks in the room and certainly folks online as well. Um, folks online, you're welcome to type into the chat or just go ahead and um, either virtually raise your hand or just unmute and, and chime in and um, let's get the question started. All right, I see one question in the chat. Um, Dennis, I'm happy to read that out to you. I don't know if you can uh, see the chat there in, in your Zoom. I'll go ahead and read it if you like. Yeah, sure. This comes from uh, Hillary. Um, let me see if I can see the last name. Hillary Foster. Um, how certain are we about uh, Japonicus not vectoring any bird diseases? Hmm. OK, that's a fair question. Um, um, when Japonicus first arrived in the island, the first thing I did was challenge it with um, avian malaria. Um, so in the laboratory, that means we infected, in this case, a, a duckling with uh, the parasite. And then I fed um, both uh, Culex quinquefasciatus, our vector, and um, Aedes japonicus that I collected from the field on those ducks, and then followed the development of the malaria in them. And malaria does not develop in Aedes japonicus. And so I'm fairly confident that um, nothing is happening in the field. I also um, collected a lot of Japonicus in the field and um, dissected them looking to see if I could find any evidence of parasites uh, naturally occurring in them and found none. Um, that being said, our other pathogen, um, avian pox, is mechanically, it's a virus. It's a fairly stable environmental virus. Um, and it is uh, mechanically transmitted. That is, the virus basically contaminates the mouth parts of the mosquito, and the next time a mosquito feeds on a bird, it can um, transmit the virus to the bird. And those lesions look pretty nasty, but in many cases, the birds do survive the infection and self-heal. Um, at least that's what some of our long-term evidence uh, research evidence suggests. So no to malaria, possibly to pox. Thank you, Dennis. Someone else online at the moment. Any 
questions in the room? I have one. Sure. Yeah, yeah, Dennis really enjoyed seeing the actual procedure, the process that you have for um, counting the mosquitoes in the field. I was curious about the uh, the bird surveys, though, how those are approached. And um, you, know, you, saw, you showed those bird survey transects. Um, are those, uh, those counts, those detections, are those actual visual detections? Are you doing those by sound as well? I see that Rick Camp is online. And since Rick is the one who manages most of that data and performs a lot of those um, um, surveys, I, perhaps it's best if he answers that question so you get an accurate answer. Thank you, Dennis. Next time I'll take my name off. Um, so um, that's, a, that's a really good question. All of the data that Dennis presented on is uh, point transect distance sampling counts that have been conducted here in the, in the States, um, starting with the HFBS, the Hawaii Forest Bird Survey, back in 1976 to 1983 by Mike Scott. Subsequent surveys follow that same format where counts and are, are collected with the distance. The distance is used to correct for the decay in detectability, thus our counts are adjusted by detection probability and we have densities per unit area. So are they mostly visual or auditory? Uh, most of them are auditory counts uh, or detections, excuse me. It's actually um, between 20 and 30% that are visually observed. Um, so that means the vast majority, 80 plus percent, are of auditory detections. What the counters do in that situation is they place the bird into the environment and then estimate the distance from themselves to where they think the bird is located. That can induce a bias, but with lots of calibration and training, we've minimized that. Thank you, Rick. All right, I see a question uh, in the chat from Julie Denslow. Um, Julie says, fascinating work. What are your projections on mosquito population movements going forward? Mm. Um, well, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I'm not 100% certain. I mean, the, the working hypothesis here was that um, drying trends would create more habitat um, that the mosquitoes could then use um, to either invade uh, the refuge from below, kind of in a stepping stone fashion. As habitat becomes available to them, they can move into it, become more established on the site, and progress up the mountain. Um, I'm a little more concerned um, when I look at the water temperatures. Um, if you look at ambient temperatures, most of the refuge, or um, at least um, up in, well, a good portion of the refuge, is still available um, theoretically to um, the mosquito. In other words, if you look at that uh, 10 degrees um, as, a, as a limiting um, temperature for the presence of the mosquito, a good deal of Hakala for a good deal of the year, um, it should theoretically should have mosquitoes in it. But when I look at how cool those uh, pools are um, for a considerably long time in the winter, also knowing that um, that's when the winter storms might occur and there'll be a greater uh, frequency of flushing of the streams, it's hard to imagine mosquitoes becoming more established in the streams to the point where they're established in the refuge. Now, um, Stephanie's research was focused on looking at the other um, most common habitat for larval mosquitoes, and that is um, cavities created in, in tree ferns by the feeding of feral pigs. And Hakalau does control their feral pig populations, but fences do break down and pigs do get in, and habitat uh, continues to be formed. And if you go over just north up into Lapahoihoi, forest reserve where there are plenty of pigs and plenty of hopu'u cavities, you find that the mosquitoes are all over the place uh, in those cavities. Uh, they're also, also into the stream beds here as well, as our data has shown. 
Um, but my point being that uh, Stephanie really did some exhaustive work up in Hakalau, and she could not find any mosquitoes in those pu'u cavities. So I prefer at the moment to stay optimistic that um, Hakalau may be safe for a little bit longer yet. Um, but this is clearly just a first pass through on the data, and I may be missing something. So I won't, uh, I won't be held to that. See a couple more questions in here. Um, one from Nelson first, and I'm, I'm happy to read these questions. Nelson, I, I, and I see one from Lorraine. Um, feel free to unmute too if you'd like to read the question out. Otherwise, I'm happy to. Okay, where are we here? I'm looking. All right, I'll go ahead. Not, oh, it is Nelson. Yeah, my, my computer is rather slow at the moment. So, uh, but my question is, do you guys have a way to measure uh, disease within individual birds? And so a measure of prevalence within the bird populations and how that's changed over time? Yes, we do. And, um, and we regularly do that. Um, well, we don't regularly do that. We do that when funding is available and people are interested in us doing it. Over the years, Carter and I have, um, uh, well, a number of us at the center have sampled um, birds at Hakalau and other places for prevalence. Um, the last time I, I, I did a survey was in 2012, and I compared it to the surveys that Carter and I did in 1998. And at the time, we found that uh, the prevalence, which was fairly low in 1998, had um, almost ha been halved over that period of time. The problem with those kind of spot, um, you know, look at it, you know, one year and then look at it again, 15 years later, it's very hard to tell what's happening in the intervening years. Now, for the most part, avian malaria is a chronic infection in natural birds. So you can assume that, you know, they're not just getting infected over a short period of time, birds are dying off, and then you're seeing a reduction in the prevalence. Um, but it does seem that that was a real reduction over the course of time. But the fact that we do see resident birds at Hakalau that are infected tells us that some kind of transmission occurs at some point over these periods of time. Now, some of these birds are very long lived and they're not horribly affected by a chronic infection. So we could be looking at when we find and test a bird as positive, we could be looking at a bird that's had that chronic infection for five years, and maybe the last transmission event in the refuge occurred five years ago. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Nelson, for your question. Uh, I see another one from Lorraine. Wow. Yeah, uh, that's a great question about competition, and it was the first thing I started thinking about when I noticed that Japonicus was in the same limited habitat as, as Quinca fasciatus. And um, <clears throat> I've tried a number of experiments, both in the field and um, in the laboratory to see if I could get at this. Um, it does seem that um, Japonicus almost has a constant presence in, in, in particularly these small, um, the first studies we did were, were in, um, uh, mesocosms that were mimicking kind of the hapu'u cavities in the field. We were also looking in hapu'u cavities. And uh, it does seem in the field when we visit the hapu'u cavities, there's always Japonicus present, it seems, and only periodically Culex quinquefasciatus. But when there is, they seem to be in good number. And I don't think that they're directly competing with each other because the 80s mosquitoes are typically grazers they kind of feed on the biofilm on the substrate of whatever natural container they're in, whereas Culex quinquefasciatus is more a filter feeder. So they're kind of suspended in the water column and taking bacteria out of the water body itself. Um, but it, it does seem that there's more seasonality to those uh, Culex quinquefasciatus populations. But in the field, we haven't seen a, a vast um, uh, decrease in Culex numbers following the introduction and establishment of Japonicus. Unfortunately, that would have been a very convenient thing for uh, our mistakes to provide. 
Thank you for that question, Randy. Thanks, Dennis. Obviously, the question coming from L.A. Parsons. I can see that. I need to see that for you, right? Yeah, it's a, it, it is a good question. Um, you know, again, um, as El Nino will affect uh, precipitation and uh, the number of storms, the frequencies, the storms, it's kind of hard, hard to predict. Um, we are hoping to keep uh, collecting data from the field till the end of the year. So maybe we'll be able to answer that question next year. in the room. Yeah, pause for a few seconds, see if there's any remaining online there. Let's give Dennis another round of applause. Thank you very much. So this concludes our Slice of Podcast seminar series for this academic year. We're going to take a break for the summer and return in September. Thank you to all those that filled out our online surveys um, at the end of our seminars this past year. We'll be looking at those closely as we plan our seminar series for 2023-24. Um, welcome further suggestions. Again, that survey will pop up um, as you log off or soon. Um, continue to look out for reminders and links to talks this fall in the email or visit the PyCast website under events, and, uh, events for information and sign up links. For those of you who are joining us in person, uh, please join us for a slice of pie, which Rachel again has kindly uh, baked for us. So, hello, Rachel, and thank you for uh, running the show here. We really appreciate all your hard work. Thank you all for joining us, and look forward to look forward to seeing you all again. Thanks, all.